there were really three elements in our campaign that made the difference for us. Number one, we actually had a population that was ready and willing to have the conversation about the future. The ground was fertile that we were trying to sow our seeds in, and there were many reasons for that. But one of the reasons that's most germane to you folks today is the fact that there were so many, there are so many organizations in Calgary that are really focused on continuing the civic conversation and on civic engagement uh, overall. And so, for example, uh, we have these Pachakacha nights that, you know, where people come and speak on a common theme, 20 PowerPoint slides, 20 seconds each. And these things regularly sell out four or 500 seat theaters. We have not one, not two, not three, but five TEDx organizations in Calgary. And they are so popular that for most of them, you have to apply to attend the TED lecture. You have to write an essay on why you should go. So we really were working in a community that was very ready and very primed. And a lot of the work that Student Vote and other organizations do really does the work to prime the pump on this stuff, I think. Number two, all of those articles uh, and analyses about my campaign tended to leave out the candidate. I like to think the candidate had something to do with it. A little bit. But what I really mean by that is that it really was the philosophy of how we were managing the election. We called it politics in full sentences. And that line, politics in full sentences, by the way, I thought I had stolen from a uh, successful city council candidate in Edmonton who had run three years prior. He was elected when he, he was, I think, 28 years old, a great guy called Don Iveson. And so I stole his line and after the election, People kept quoting my line all over the national and international media. And I felt bad because I had plagiarized it. So I made sure to say, you know, I stole it from this guy, Don Iveson. You should check out Don Iveson. And he eventually called me and said, okay, two things. Number one, it's not politics in full sentences. It's politics in complete sentences. And I said, great, I improved on it. And then he said, number two, it's not my line. I stole it from the West Wing. So now I have to plagiarize both Don and the West Wing. But what that meant for us was that we really ran a, a platform based on ideas. So every week we released a new portion of our platform. We called it the Better Ideas Campaign. And at the end of the campaign, we had 12 of these better ideas. A better idea would be something like Calgary Transit needs to be the preferred choice, not the last choice for citizens. Or... Political campaigns need to be about ideas, not about money. So we'd have a pithy sentence. We have kind of a one-page overview of the idea, a detailed three or four or five-page background, or usually with footnotes about what it was I was intending on doing, as well as video, a YouTube video and podcast. And we did that every week. And someone pointed out to me towards the end of the campaign that any one of those 12 better ideas contain more words in it than the combined policy platforms of all of my opponents. And people thought this was weird, right? The conventional wisdom was no one will engage at this level of detail. You'll just come off looking like a wonk. And we found just the opposite to be true. There was a, when I made my kickoff, when I made my kickoff speech, this guy just showed up, somebody I didn't know. And he showed up with a handheld video camera and a couple of those little $99 flip cameras that were mounted on C-clamps like you would get at the hardware store. And he asked the volunteers, do you mind if I film this guy's speech? And they didn't know what to do, so they said, oh, all right, go ahead and film it. So this guy filmed it. It turns out that he had, his name is Gordon, and it turns out that Gordon had edited a video of me speaking at one of these TEDx lectures, and he thought it was really interesting. So when he heard that I was making a speech, he just decided to show up and film it. He edited the video overnight. He put it up on YouTube the next day, 14 minutes long. And in the conventional wisdom about the internet, nothing more than two minutes will grab people's attention. Lady Gaga videos, nobody watches past the first two minutes. And I am hardly as visually appealing as Lady Gaga. <laughs> Justin Bieber, maybe. Lady Gaga, no. We'll get back to Justin Bieber. Uh, that's just to keep you listening. So... The video, Lady Gaga, me, no, just me, 
14 minutes long. We actually had more hits on that video than on any of the YouTube videos of any of my candidates. And because we had access to the YouTube analytics, we realized people were watching the whole darn thing from beginning to end. And this made us realize that people really were willing to engage at a much deeper level than we were giving credit for. Which takes us to the third piece. And the third piece is an old political adage. And the old political adage is, go to people where they live. Don't expect them to come to you. Very simple, right? So we did that in a very serious way offline. So every single festival, party, church basement, synagogue, backyard barbecue, living room of people's houses, we were there. We were there continually. Want to know how many debates we did over the course of our mayoral election? Two in the federal election. In our mayoral election, 34. And I went to every single one. So we were really out there. It's funny, my iPhone just rang, and it's the guy I beat running for mayor who's calling. What did I do? It's called me. Hmm. Anyway. We're still friends, believe it or not, because those debates, actually, and this is a key point, because those debates were incredibly respectful. It's not like we made a deal, but we actually said we're going to treat people like adults and we're going to talk to people like their participants in the decisions that impact them. And it really made a difference. In terms of going to people where they live, the other thing that we discovered is that a lot of people live online. And we needed to reach those people online. And I don't mind telling you that I'm a professor. And my colleagues who teach political science thought that I was completely insane. And they said to me, you know, only young people are online. They're apathetic. They don't vote. Why are you wasting your time? And I said, I know what I'm doing. I do teach marketing after all. Let me try this. And they were very, very wrong. And they were wrong for two reasons. Number one, less relevant to you guys, is that in fact, not only young people live online. Calgary has 1.2 million people. It has 600,000 active Facebook users, which is to say everyone's on Facebook. The average age of Calgarians is 34.3 years old. The average age of my Facebook fan page is over 35. So it's actually a very nice representation of the overall demographic. But what's more important than that is that there is no such thing as the apathetic youth vote. I have never in my life met young person doesn't care about the future, who doesn't care about the kind of community they live in, who doesn't care about what they're trying to do in their education, right? The problem is that we've got a disconnect between the things people care about, their hopes and fears and dreams and challenges for their own futures, and the institutions, especially government, that are supposed to be helping them. It's a form of disempowerment, really, that people don't see that connection. And we were working hard on trying to repair that connection and really getting people involved in that way. So the use of our tools was nothing new. Everybody, every other candidate had a Twitter account. Every other candidate had a Facebook page. Every other candidate had a YouTube channel. What was different was the way in which we used it. Instead of using these tools as a form of press releases, I said, I want to, go I want to campaign the way I want to govern. I want to really engage in authentic two-way dialogue with the people who I want to vote for me. So really it wasn't any great science, it was just me. I am the way I am. And we would ask lots of questions. We would say to people, you know, what do you think about this? When we release those better ideas and we put them online, we let people comment on them and we never deleted a comment, whether they agreed or disagreed with us. Our only rule was don't be racist and don't be really mean to one another. And probably over the course of the whole campaign, we had to moderate three comments. But if people disagreed with us, that was fine. We'd put it up and we'd let the community talk about it and see if they could come up with a better policy together. And people really, really respond. Which takes, brings me to Justin Bieber. I know you've been waiting. The Biebs and I have a lot in common. <laughs> Outstanding hair. Great good looks. Teenage girls love us. <laughs> Neither of us can see well. And we're the only ones with the password to the Twitter account. 
So when you see me on Twitter, it's really me. There's no filter, which sometimes drives my communications guy crazy. But it's just me. What, what Biebs and I don't share in common, though, is our Twitter follower list. Because, yes, there are a lot of people who are following him online, way more than are following me. But the folks who are following me online are not the same people, by and large. There are a couple. And every time I make that joke about him, I get a few Bieber followers getting mad at me. But mostly it's different people. These are people who are following politics online. And you know who those people are? They're you guys. They're what I call the hyper-engaged voter. They're the people whose friends ask them, hey, who should I vote for? And what we realized is that over the course of the summer, when very few other people were paying attention to politics, the hyper-engaged people were seriously paying attention to politics. And we grabbed them and we got them early. And they became evangelists for the cause. You know, a political campaign is only about one thing. The only reason you run a campaign and you have doors, uh, uh, lawn signs and door knocking and everything else, there's only one reason. And that reason is that you're trying to identify the vote. So you're trying to get the names and addresses of voters for your database so that on election day, you will phone them multiple times, you'll send someone over to knock on their door, and you'll make sure they vote. That's it. And conventional wisdom says that every identified voter you have in your database is worth two or three actual votes. They'll convince their spouse to vote, maybe they'll convince a kid to vote, and so on. We discovered it was those hyper-engaged voters that we were dealing with, some young, some old, those were probably worth to us two, three, four hundred votes because these people were not shy. Once they made up their mind, they would tell everyone they knew. They would color their Facebook avatar purple. They would get out there in real life and start spreading the word. You couldn't get through Thanksgiving dinner with them until they convinced you to who to vote for. And it was amazing to get these folks working as evangelists early on. And that was really our major strategy and our focus. And it really did pay enormous dividends from a political aspect. I'm going on way too long, and I'm sure Taylor and all of you have some questions, but I want to share with you one story. During one of those 34 debates that I went to, it was organized by grade nine students at the Calgary Science School. And being students at the Calgary Science School, they webcast it to every grade nine classroom in Calgary. So about 1,500 people watched this debate. And I was the only one of the leading candidates who bothered to show up. And when I spoke with the other candidates, including the guy who was just on the phone, why didn't you go? They said, well, what's the point? 14-year-olds can't vote. I would have spent more time, my time was better spent somewhere else. And I thought to myself, wow, you are really stupid. <laughs> Luckily, I didn't tell them that. And they were really stupid for two reasons. Number one is, as you well know, there is no force on earth more powerful than a teenager who is convinced that she has a good idea. <laughs> and notice I said she, because particularly a teenage girl who's convinced she has a good idea. She will tell everyone she knows, she will convince everyone, parents, siblings, cousins, uncles, and aunts that they've got to do their democratic duty. And of course that happened. But I'll tell you the end of the story. And the end of the story is I happened to be at the University of Calgary making a lecture on the day that the advance polls opened. So I kept walking by the advance polls. It was a bit embarrassing because the candidate really shouldn't be hanging around the polls, but they were right in the middle of the food court. But as I was walking by, I saw all these kids, these, these children, and they were holding protest signs. And I thought to myself, what's going on here? And I realized that these were the grade nine students from the Calgary Science School. They had been so inspired at that debate. Oh, are you still there? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just lost video for a second there. They had been so inspired by that debate that they had convinced their teacher to give them the, time, the day off school. And they went to the universities. They knew the advanced polls were that day. And the protest signs they were holding said things like, I can't vote, but you can and they were literally shaming the university students one at a time into going to vote. And when I say literally shaming, I'm literally shaming. They were grabbing them by the elbow. And if the students said, well, I don't know enough about the issues, they'd say, well, here are the issues. Here are where the candidates stand. Now go vote. 
It was remarkable. And it showed me the power of engaging every citizen in the community and how we can use tools and mechanisms to make sure that those people are engaged. And to me, that was probably the single most gratifying moment of the election. Winning was also gratifying, but <laughs> watching those kids start what I know will be a habit that will never leave. If a kid at the age of 14 is standing in a university food court with a protest sign, that kid is going to vote in every single election that kid is eligible to vote in. And I think that that for the rest of their lives. And I think that was very exciting. What would you suggest to our leaders uh, with regards to their campaign right now? Well, I am extremely disappointed in this campaign um, because I think what you said is exactly right, that we are underestimating the voter and we're boiling everything down to caricature. Michael Ignatieff is just visiting and doesn't care about Canada. He only cares about you. Stephen Harper is the second coming of Attila the Hun. You know, none of these things are true, right? These are good, honorable people, I hope, who want to do good things for the community. And what is this election about? I just made a speech where I said, it reminds me of Seinfeld. It's an election about nothing. <laughs> what issues have come to the surface? Can we even say, what's the difference in the opinions of the parties on health care? I have no idea, right? But I know how long Michael Ignati has spent living outside of Canada. So I've been deeply, deeply disappointed. And part of the problem comes from the politicians. I mean, we're the ones who make the angry speeches. We're the ones who approve the negative campaign ads um, and set the tone. And that's really a challenge because, quite honestly, we've got probably at least two political parties who are not interested in higher voter turnout. Higher voter turnout can actually hurt them. And so we get things like negative campaign ads. You know why negative campaign ads are effective, right? Every political consultant will tell you they're effective, but do you know why? It's not because they convince people to vote for your guy. It's because they convince your, the other guy's supporters to stay home. They're deliberately designed to suppress voter turnout. And I think that's really cynical. So we as citizens have to demand better. I've been spending the last couple of weeks loudly bleeding about the need for there to be an urban agenda in this election, for us to really understand where the parties stand on cities. And I think what we really need to do is we need to have citizens do the same and use online tools and go to the forums and demand a higher level of debate, discussion and discourse from our political parties. And it is only because voters demand it that people will listen. And, and, you know, that's the key. And there are tactics, right? You know, for example, we need to encourage university students to vote on campus so that those numbers in the advance polls on campus are very high so that the parties understand that university students are voting and there's someone that needs to be listened to. So a bunch of tactics like that. But we as citizens have to demand the kind of discussion that we as citizens need. Um, just a quick question. Is there any chance of you um, pursuing possibly a larger political role in the future once you're finished with being mayor of Calgary? I don't know. I'm pretty large already, really. But I uh, know. Thank you for asking. Um, there's a reason. One of the reasons that I am uh, so happy where I am is precisely because there's no political parties in municipal politics in Alberta. And I get to say really controversial things and be my own guy which is great. And I love cities. So, you know, so, so far, so good. I'm only six months into the job, but I appreciate your asking. <laughs> uh, quick question. Very impressive use of media throughout your whole campaign. Um, the way you hyper engaged, uh, whether you contact, how you contacted them and maintain them. I'm just wondering to what extent are you still using that now that you are mayor and the role that it plays in the information highway? in terms of Calgarians? All the time. Uh, one of my philosophies really was, as I said, to run a campaign the way I want to govern. So I'll give you an example. Last week, we made a significant change to our transit system in Calgary. We stopped charging for parking at our C train stations to encourage people to drive to the station and then take the train. And this was a change that I had long championed. It was the right thing to do. But we did a lousy job of implementing it. Um, and there was, there was mass confusion, the signage was poor, things like that. And so I sent out a simple Facebook message and a tweet just after the morning rush hour. And all it said was, 
Today was the first day of the new system. How did your commute go? How can we do a better job? And I got hundreds of responses from citizens. And, you know, some people said, well, it didn't work, and this is what you should do to fix it. And some people said it worked great. Most people said it worked great. But by far the most common response I got was, wow, thanks for asking. <laughs> no one's ever asked before. And so that's really what we're trying to do. And we're finding the new tools are working really well. One of the other things I'm working on right now is we've invested a lot of money and a lot of time into a new budgeting process, which I call participatory budgeting. Um, we're really trying to get the public more involved in crafting the budget. And so we're using a number of tools. And in fact, uh, we, had a, we had a report, um, a reporter, I should say, write a column saying that this process isn't working very well because nobody is going to the open houses. And it's true, nobody's going to the open houses. We get 25 or 30 people and we're thrilled at one of these open houses that we're doing all over the city. But are people ever connecting online? We have a tool called an ideas marketplace where you get to vote between two ideas. Which one do you like better? We've had it up for a week and a half. We've already received 65,000 votes. By contrast, New York City used the same tool a few years ago. New York City, big city, huh? Over six months, they got 50,000 votes. We got one third more than that in a week. So people are really, really starting to engage much, much more in these online communities. And that's something we're working hard on staying, uh, staying in front of. Do anything uh, for our democracy, what would you do? Oh, what a good question. So many things, right? I mean, there are a number of structural things we need to do. And I'm particularly engaged in cities and communities. That's what I'm excited about. And structurally, we need to change our entire system of government um, in terms of how cities collect revenues and how we provide services. It's where we've been the poor cousin or the junior partner of Confederation for way too long, and we need to fix that. Um, and I think that that will make a big difference because it will help with the big philosophical problem. And here's the philosophical problem, especially at the municipal level, but I also think at the federal and provincial levels, people have lost the relationship between the taxes they pay and the fees they pay on one hand and the services they receive as part of the community on the other. And it's similar to what I was talking about before, about how people don't see the connection between their own hopes and dreams and government. And we've got to repair that. We've got to help people understand. And this is not a left-wing or a right-wing statement. It is a statement that government can be a positive force in people's lives, regardless of their political philosophy. The government exists to make people's lives better in whichever way, whichever way uh, you, you think ideologically that's the right thing to do. And we've got to mend that relationship. And I believe that mending that relationship actually means stepping back from partisanship. Again, it's one of the reasons I like working at the, at the municipal level, because I don't have parties to deal with. But when I look at what's happening at the federal level and at the provincial level, and it's just even in a minority government situation where you think people would have to work together, there is such blind partisanship. You know, question period is a disgrace. Um, and we really need to be able to get beyond the partisanship and say those who are honest, those who stand up for citizens, regardless of ideology, and try to do the right thing for people are people who will succeed politically. And it's going to take us as citizens to make that change happen. The parties are not going to do it on their own. Uh, Mayor, it's very nice to see you again. Um, next time I will make sure we get you in person. Um, I can't think of a better way to close uh, Democracy Boot Camp other than a couple thanks. Um, please keep doing what you're doing because the whole country is watching you. You're such an example. Thank you. And more important to all of you, keep doing what you're doing. This may be a boot camp, but you're all well on the way to making change and understand and know that the work you're doing today will result in change for all of your neighbors and all of our fellow citizens. So keep on doing it. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you.